Madam President, uh, thank you. Um, Sir Rodri, of course, is a very entertaining speaker, and um, any senior diplomat is well trained in, in spinning a good story. But I'd <laughs> like to begin <laughs> this. <laughs> journalist, <laughs> journalist, Journalists, as you know full well, Sir Roderick, only stick to the facts. I'd like to begin by drawing the attention of this House to the wording of tonight's debate, which Sir Roderick tried skillfully to um, avoid, which is not that we wish to convince you that Putin has created paradise in Russia, but that simply Vladimir Putin has been good for Russia. Has been. Those of us on this side who believe that to be true are not required to convince honourable members and this House that he is now or will forever be the best option for Russia. Merely that, as President, Putin has improved conditions for Russians at home and raised Russia's standing in the world. And there's ample evidence for both of these propositions. Let's start with the most obvious. Putin is the single most entertaining leader in the modern world stage. <laughs> Francois Hollande may have attempted to steal that crown in recent weeks, <laughs> but when Putin gets romantically linked, it's with world-class Olympic athletes, not mere actresses. Instead of getting fed to the media lions like Barack Obama or David Cameron, Putin once shot a tiger to save a TV crew. <laughs> when Putin poses for a photo op, it isn't simply with uh, babies or smiling pensioners, it's with polar bears and leopards. <laughs> and despite the well-justified criticisms of Russia's anti-gay law, pictures of a topless Putin on horseback or with a rifle in hand have made him a global gay icon. <laughs> The serious point is that nobody any longer equates Russia with the senile gerontocracy or drunken buffoonery of the Soviet era or under Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s. Putin has created a modern leadership style that meets the demands of today's hyper-connected social media reality. And that has been good for changing the image of Russia in the minds of people worldwide who only ever thought of it in outdated Cold War terms. Putin has also restored Russia's influence in world affairs, based not on threats of force, as in the Soviet era, but on the forceful insistence on diplomacy. This has paid notable dividends in Syria, where Russia saved the Obama administration from an ill-formed intervention by brokering a deal which has led to the destruction, or is leading to the destruction, of Syria's chemical weapons. And in Iran, where Russia has been instrumental in bringing Tehran to the negotiating table over its nuclear program. It's not so long ago that the world was contemplating yet another war in the Middle East with Iran. Nor is it true that Putin is instinctively anti-Western. He wants voice support for joining NATO, and Russia allows NATO staff and materiel to transit Russian airspace on the mission to Afghanistan. Putin was the first foreign leader to call George W. Bush after the attacks of 9-11 to offer Russia's support. If he bristles now, it's not because he's an authoritarian leader, it's because in part of a sense of betrayal that he feels by the United States over missile defense in Europe and on what he regarded as the manipulation of Russian support for the mission in Libya. He does not wish to get fooled again. Now, next, Russia has, Putin has been unquestionably good for Russians' living standards. As my colleague has already intimated, uh, living standards have risen considerably. According to the World Bank uh, data for 2012, GDP per capita in Russia was some $14,000, about the same as Poland or Hungary, both countries which have transitioned from communism and have received something like a decade's worth of European Union aid. In 2000, when Putin came to power, the World Bank put Russia's GDP at just $1,775. That in Poland and Hungary was three times higher. That's the gap that Putin has closed. Pensions and government salaries have been substantially increased, and are paid on time. In stark contrast to the Russia of the 1990s, people have certainty. For the first time in a century too, a real middle class has emerged in Russia, with independent wealth who are not afraid to voice their opinion on everything from corruption to electoral fraud. And despite what my esteemed opponent said, while it's certainly true that uh, Russia's media is becoming ever more tightly muzzled, you don't have to spend long on the internet to see a very lively and uh, oppositional mood taking place on the internet among <coughs> Russians every day. There is certainly freedom of speech on the internet and Russians are making use of it. Now the mechanisms may not, may not yet exist for this class to express its influence upon the political system. That is certainly regrettable. 
But its existence, the existence of this middle class, is a real achievement of Putin's that will have a profound beneficial effect on Russia's future development. And despite the popular caricature of him as an evil Bond villain, driven by KGB instincts, as we've already heard from my opponents, Putin is not very difficult to understand. In reality, he's a conservative patriot, the Russian equivalent of a high Tory. He puts God, country, and tradition ahead of all other values. This may be surprising for uh, uh, people who regard Russia as the home of communism, but Putin is certainly not a communist. His political role model is Pyotr Stolypin, who was a reforming prime minister from 1906 until he was assassinated in 1911. Many of you will know that Stolypin famously declared, give the state 20 years of internal and external peace and you will not recognize Russia. It's clearly the motto by which Putin lives. And we should never forget the context in which he is governing. Russians emerged from the brutalizing Soviet experience of 70 years, not as some eager Western-leaning liberal Democrats, but as a shattered society, mistrustful of authority, of each other, and of any sort of collective civil activity. It was a society whose experiences and views had been frozen in aspect of Soviet ideology and closed off from the outside world. So when Russia is criticized for its failings, and both my uh, friend and my opponent have listed many of those failings, Russians themselves are the first to recognize them. And those failings and those criticisms are usually highlighted by countries that have taken hundreds of years of trial and error to achieve their present levels of tolerance and liberal democracy. Russia has had less than 25 years to find its way. Corruption, state brutality, indifference to individual human rights all exist in modern day Russia. But they did not suddenly appear in Russia under Putin. They were integral to the way the country was run during decades of totalitarianism and genuine terror under the Soviets. By comparison, all of the alleged terror that's taking place is a, a, a mere kindergarten school to what was taking place routinely under the Soviets. We should be astonished at the remarkable progress Russia is making on an accelerating learning curve, both socially and economically, not scolding it for failing to move fast enough. Indeed, I would go so far as to assert, and I hope my opponents will take this, that the present period is the best time in Russia in the last hundred years in which to be a Russian citizen, both in terms of freedom of thought, freedom of movement, and personal wealth. And it is Vladimir Putin, but they have the freedom to emigrate and to come and go as they wish. Rus millions of Russians leave the country every year and come back. It's called taking a holiday. <laughs> Putin, <laughs> Putin has created the staple framework of governance, however imperfect, still lacking in democratic accountability, in which this progress is taking place. As my uh, learned friend has already uh, highlighted, Putin heads an enviably orthodox administration which most European governments in economic terms can only dream of replicating. It has practically no budget deficit, one of the world's lowest debt ratios, unemployment <laughs> is at an historic low, and it has one of the world's largest foreign currency reserves. The United Nations ranked it third last year for foreign direct investment, so clearly business is voting with its feet and choosing Russia. Russians experienced two enormous social calamities before Putin's arrival in 1991 with the Soviet collapse, and in 1998 with the currency collapse. They have no desire to experience a third such calamity. They recognize Putin's faults. Indeed, a majority, according to a recent poll, do not wish him to stand again in 2018. But they recognize also the substantial achievements that have been made by Russia under his presidency. And I believe fair-minded people and our opponents must also recognize these facts and conclude that, Russia, that Vladimir Putin has indeed been good for Russia. Thank you.